All right, so this chapter, chapter eight, that we're heading into here, it is all about receivables, okay? Receivables are assets. This is money that other people owe to you. And so uh, someone had asked, oh, just recently, actually, what's the difference really between an account receivable and a note receivable? And I, and I think my response was something like, one's more formal than the other. So an account receivable is an informal arrangement between uh, usually a buyer and a seller. And it arises because the seller allows the buyer an amount of time before they have to pay for goods or services that are delivered. This is a very, very normal relationship, especially in most commercial transactions. Not so much in um, consumer interactions. So usually when you go to the store and buy things, they expect you to pay right then and there, right? That's the, that's the norm. But in, in you know, business relationships, so a supplier who provides goods to a, a retail store, it's very normal to give them a window of time. The most common is 30 days, uh, sometimes 60. And then sometimes if you have a big enough buyer, they can sort of demand certain payment terms from the seller. So for example, Freeport McMoran, that's the big copper uh, mining company here, they have a relationship with almost all of their vendors that they have 120 days to pay. That's four months. And so actually when I'm helping people who are starting a business that helps the mine, we have to kind of price that into their business planning, right? They have to recognize that they're gonna be providing goods and services for four months before they start getting paid. So they've gotta have enough cash to cover themselves for that four months before the money starts rolling in. So it's actually a pretty important thing to understand the terms of these uh, receivables if, if you're the company that's, that's getting the receivable or it would be a payable to the other company, right? How long they have to pay. All right, so accounts receivable, probably the most common thing you'll see. Uh, we've done lots of accounts receivable uh, transactions, so it's not really anything new. Let's see if that's gonna work. And then notes receivable, which are more formal in nature, meaning we usually actually draw up what's called a note. It's just an agreement um, that kind of stipulates all of the terms of how we're lending the money in or borrowing the money, depending on which side we're on. Okay, and we'll, we'll learn more about that. And then there's other receivables um, that just arise out of regular doing business. Um, probably the most common is interest receivable. If I loan money to somebody, then if you think about it for actually every, every day that they don't pay me, then that's interest receivable money. That's owed, additional money that's owed to me on top of just the amount I lent them, things like that. All right. So a couple questions come up when we're dealing with, um, receivables. The first is if people can't pay us, how do we deal with that from an accounting standpoint? So it happens all the time. People will just come to you, hopefully, and they'll say like, hey, look, my business is struggling and I, I can't pay you. I know you lent me money, but I, I have no way of paying you. And so the question is, well, what do I do about that? Not what do I do about that? Like, do I hire some guys to go beat them up and get the money from them? That's a different sort of question, not an accounting question. That's more of an operations question. Um, the, the, the accounting question is, what does that look like on my books? Okay, so there's two ways that you can deal with this on your book. Uh, and the first one is called the direct write-off method. And it's not the preferred method. It's not accepted under GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, because it doesn't, um, well, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work very well with the matching principle. Okay, the idea that the expense of something has to match up with the, 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 any revenue that might be gained from it. But still, it's a method that some people use, especially small businesses who deal mostly in cash. So here's an example of it. It says, assume that a $4,200 account receivable from D.L. Ross has been determined to be uncollectible. The entry to write off the account is as follows. And all we do is we debit an expense account that we call bad debt expense. And then we credit the accounts receivable account. And that will take it out of accounts receivable. So now it shows that person doesn't owe us anymore. And we take it as an expense. Okay. Remember expenses reduce our net income. Uh, and so this is just like saying we sold this to somebody, they promised to pay us and now they can't pay us. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to take it as an expense. 
Sometimes what we do is instead of doing that, we negotiate a note with the person. We say, look, okay, you can't pay us within 30 days. Can you pay us within a year? Or can you make monthly payments of whatever that would be, 4,200 divided by 12 for the next year? Right? You, you can negotiate payment terms. But sometimes you also look at a business and you're like, there's no way they're going to pay me. Right? It's kind of like when you loan money to that friend and then you just know you're never going to get it back. Stop loaning money to that friend. All right, guys. Um, although sometimes you think, sometimes I'll just say to my friend, look, I, I won't loan you money, but I'll give you some money. Like, like, you know, I don't want, because I don't want it to like ruin our friendship, but if I give it to them as a gift, I'm good. And they don't have to worry about the stress of paying me back. Right. So direct write off, we debit bad debt expense. We credit the account receivable. That's the process. Um, every once in a while, and it's a wonderful day when it happens, somebody whose debt you've written off will call you and be like, Hey. I got some money, I can finally pay you. And so you don't wanna be like, oh, don't worry about it, I wrote it off. So what you do is you reinstate the debt and then you receive the payment, okay? So the process of reinstating the debt is honestly just the reverse of what we did as, as the write-off. So we debit accounts receivable and credit bad debt expense. So the bad debt expense goes down, account receivable goes back up. Then we show the receipt of payment. Cash goes up and account receivable goes down and we're good. If you think about it, that's the standard transaction when someone pays you, right, for money they owe you. You debit cash, credit accounts receivable. So really to do a reinstatement, you're just reversing the write-off. All right. Like I said, though, the problem with the direct write-off method is a lot of times you'll have a person who borrowed money from you in a previous period, and now in this period, you're writing it off, and so you have this expense that doesn't go with the initial borrowing, and it creates all sorts of confusion from an accrual accounting standpoint, okay? So the solution that they've come up with, which is about five times as complex, um, think about all the adjusting entries, right? Like in order to try to make our books match nicely, we go through a lot of complexity. Um, uh, things that people outside of accounting never assume, right? They're always like surprised by these things. Um, like, oh, I thought you just wrote down whenever you got money. And you're like, sort of, but I have to make this estimate as the amount I think I'm going to actually get. And then, I, you know, anyway. So with the allowance method, what we do um, is at the end of our accounting period, so this company's end is December 31st, uh, we look at our accounts receivable balance and we estimate how much of that balance we think is probably not going to be collectible in the next year. And we'll go through a couple of methods people use to make that estimate. But you make an estimate, and then um, you do a journal entry that says that we, where we debit bad debt expense, and we do it at the end of this current year. That allows us to take the expense during this year, because again, when someone can't pay you, it's you want to match the expense of not receiving payment with the year in which you 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 recorded the revenue. Does that make sense? Think about it. When you sell something to people, you record the revenue today and then an account receivable. So if we're gonna have a bad debt expense, we would like that expense to match up with the revenue that we recorded. So in the same accounting period. So at the end of the year, we do an estimate and then we record this journal entry. We debit bad debt expense and we create this special account called allowance for doubtful accounts. And then in the future, when we actually write off things, if we decide, oh, this guy really can't pay me, we're gonna, debit that from the allowance account. And the idea is, is that we try to keep that allowance account nicely balanced. So it, it, it's always just sort of, we're replenishing it each year and taking the expense for the amount we don't think we're gonna collect, okay? So here's an example. Let's see. Oh, actually, so that one is just, yeah, I don't like that one, let me skip it. So I'm gonna show you this picture of buckets. Behold, buckets, okay. Um, so this has shows you that what we're doing with adjusting with, with the allowance for doubtful accounts or the allowance method, okay? So we do this adjusting entry at the end of the year. What it doesn't say is not only are we filling up this bucket called the allowance for doubtful accounts, we're also taking an expense for it at the end of that year. Then in the next year, we're writing off any actual people who can't pay us. And at the end of the year, we'll kind of reevaluate how much is left in this allowance account. And do we want to maybe adjust the amount that we hold out 
as our, as our allowance for the next year. In a perfect world, you would estimate it perfectly. And then throughout the next year, all of your write-offs would like perfectly empty that bucket down to zero, right? But it's an estimate. So some years you'll, you'll have more that you have to write off and others less. It also depends on the nature of the business. I ran a storage business for lots of years. And there we have um, what's called a possessory lien. If somebody doesn't pay us, uh, the law says a possessory lien, which means I, I a possess, uh, so a lien is just like some ability for a business owner to seize the property of another person, okay? Usually you do it on paper. Uh, so if somebody, if you, if you loan money to buy a car and then they don't pay for the car, you can seize the car and that would, and you would go and actually take the car or could the repo men do, they take people's cars back. So that would be a form of possessory lien because I'm going to possess the property and hold it until you can pay me with a house. You don't usually possess it. You just, you, you write up a lien, a paper that says they can't sell this house. And if they do sell this house, I have to get paid first. So I have a lien on the house. Okay. But in storage, I have your property, right? You storing it at my property. If you haven't paid me, what I do is I go lock your unit out and you can't get to your stuff without an angle grinder or, or maybe bolt cutters. Yeah. So even if you only owe me a hundred bucks, I can seize everything in your storage until you pay me. And if you don't pay me, I can auction it. Okay. And so the way we would consider and adjust how much our accounts our allowance for double accounts is might be different than a business who doesn't have that possessory lien. Does that make sense? Because I have their property. I'm probably going to get a full, more full recovery of what's owed to me than someone who's not holding on to anyone's property. Like if I just sold you some goods and services and then you never paid me, I don't really have anything to hold against you other than your own decency or, and, and honestly, most businesses, if someone comes to them and is like, look, <laughs> like I had a guy put stuff in our storage, he got arrested and he got put in prison. And his mom came to me and was like, I don't like, I can't afford to pay for his storage. I don't know what to do, you know? And, and of course she didn't come to me until I was kept sending bills. And then six months later, right. I'm like, I'm going to auction your stuff. And that's when she finally comes. So she's, she owes us $300 or something. And, but you know, like, seriously, did I want his stuff so bad? Or did I want that $300 so bad that I'm going to like take his elderly mother, you know, so, yeah, that's, so, so we just kind of work out a deal, right? That's like, how about, you know, do you have a place on your property where you can store it? Like I have my boys go out there with a pickup and like even carry the stuff for her. not her fault. Her son's a turd and left her holding the bag. Right. Uh, maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe she raised him wrong. I don't know. Not my business. My business is like, can we help this person? And you will find that most businesses you work with are not cruel and heartless. They, they really, what they want most of anything is to make a contract with you and have you keep your end of it and they keep their end of it. And that's good business, right? I provide to you the services I promise. You provide to me the pay you said you would. I don't want to seize your property. Um, uh, I would like to never have doubtful accounts because all my customers pay. And I would like to give them a good product or service in exchange for that pay. That's what most businesses want to do. Okay. So how do we estimate the amount that we think we're not going to collect? Uh, this book will go over two different versions. There's a third version that often gets included, but the one is called a percent of sales method. So that sounds like just like what it sounds like, or what you know it is just what it sounds like, which is we're going to take a percentage of our sales and assume that that's not collectible, meaning in the next year, people won't be able to pay us for that. Um, that's based on usually historical precedent, right? Like if you've been in business 10 years and you find that on average, you can't collect a certain percentage of the amount of your sales, then you just apply that going forward. And then maybe if you find that you're having too much of an allowance left over each year, you adjust that down a little. It's just, that's the process. Okay. Again, the IRS, they might question you if you're taking this big, you know, this large expense every year, reducing your net income and therefore reducing your taxable income. Um, but if you have a basis for it, you're fine. So if you can say, look, we've been in business 10 years and this is how much on average we don't collect each year. So that's what we apply. And here's where we've adjusted it based on changes. And, you know, that's fine. That's sufficient. The other is called an analysis of receivables method. That's say looking at your receivables, everything that's owed to you and recognizing some debts are going to be harder to collect 
than others. What we found is that the longer a debt goes unpaid, the less likely you're going to collect it. So if somebody's like a, a week past due, you still have like a 95% chance they're going to pay you. They're just running a little behind. That's normal. Okay. But if somebody's 90 days past due, three months, the chances you're going to get them to pay are really low. Okay, so you go through an analysis process and I'll kind of walk you through both of those processes. So here's the percent of sales method. So here's the data for the X-Tone company, the balance of their accounts receivable, $240,000. Balance of allowance for doubtful accounts, 3,250. A credit balance, that's the normal balance for an allowance for doubtful accounts. Our total sales for the year were $3 million. And based on past experience, Bad debt is about three quarters of a percent of what we sell, okay? So if you had a problem, they would have to give you this. This is the, the givens you need to do it. In real life, you would do an analysis. You'd look back and say, well, how much do we have to write off each year on average, right? So you estimate the bad debt expense just by taking the sales, 3 million times three quarters of a percent, which would be 0 0.0075, right? Uh, and that comes out to 22,500. So they believe based on their past experience that they're not gonna be able to collect on about $22,500 of this, of this money that's owed to them. So they do a journal entry at the end of the year, bad debt expense, 22,500. That lets them take the expense this year to write off against this revenue that they earned this year. Uh, and then the allowance for doubtful accounts, they credit 22,500. And then throughout the year, when you, when you have a customer say, hey, I can't pay you, and you decide we're going to write this off, meaning we're no longer going to try to collect it, what you would do is just debit this allowance for doubtful accounts uh, and then credit accounts receivable. So what the customer shows they owe you goes down and it reduces the allowance for doubtful accounts. So you're just taking the expense at the end of the year and then adjusting against that allowance throughout the year for any actual write-offs, okay? That's the whole process. The other method, the analysis of receivables method, four easy steps, all right? Number one, the due date of each account receivable is determined. Number two, the number of days each account is past due is determined. Step three, accountants, the account is placed in an aged class or category, okay? Uh, related to its days past due. Most of the time, it's one to 30 days past due, 31 to 60 days past due, 61 to 90 days past due. This is such a normal way to do this that most accounting software has those already prefigured into it as, as the normal classes or categories of past due debt, okay? And then step four, the total of each age class is determined. So it looks something like this. Yeah, where you? Oh, Ashby and Company. Yes, nice. Uh, so here you can see they have all of these debts. Balance of each debt. Remember, this is money owed to them. It's a receivable to the company. And then, like this one's not past due. This one's thirty-one to sixty. This one's past due ninety-one to eighty days. This one's way past due. Apparently, BT Bar doesn't pay his bills. Um, Ashby's not great. Sorry, bro. Um, but the Brock company, they're on time. All right, so <laughs> I did not set this up, all right. Uh, so then what you do is you take your totals. So the total of not past due, the total of one to 30 days past due, 31 to 60, et cetera, okay? And then again, this would have to be given to you in a problem. In real life, it would be based on past experience, but you would have these percentages where you would assume Things that were not past due are only 2% uncollectible, meaning you expect to collect 98% of that money, but about 2%, you know, you probably won't based on past experience. 5% for one to 30, 10%, et cetera. So in a problem, a real problem you're doing, it's going to give you these numbers. Okay. In real life, you would have to make those assumptions yourself. Then you just apply it. So you'd take 125,000 times 2%. It takes 64,000 times 5%, 13,100 times 10%, et cetera. And then you'd add them all up and that would be your estimated uncollectible accounts. 
So in the first one, we just did, it was way simpler, right? We just multiplied the amount of sales that year times a, percent, a percentage rate. This, what we're doing is categorizing our, our debts by how far past due they are, and then applying some estimate, percentage estimate as to how much we think is uncollectible to each of those categories, and then adding it all up. So that's the major difference between the two. The other difference is that in the first one, when we were applying it to sales, we just took the amount, the percentage of our sales, and that was the amount we called bad debt expense, okay? The way they do it with these analysis of receivable methods is this amount that you come up with, the estimated uncollectible, that's the amount you want to bring your allowance for doubtful accounts up to. So if it had some balance in it, you'll actually only do enough to bring the balance back up to this amount, 26,490. The reason you do that is because each year you're recalculating this. And if you have some left over in there and then do a full debit to that account again, pretty soon it's gonna be like this huge amount in the allowance account that doesn't match up. So we're readjusting each year to, the, to, to bring it up to this allowance amount, okay? So, so the way they would do that is, they'd say, look, there's already a credit balance in the account of 3,250. We think we're not gonna be able to collect 26,490. So we take 26,490 minus the 3,250 and we're gonna debit the account 23,240, enough to bring that account balance up to our estimate, okay? That'll take a little bit of practice, but you do it a couple times, it'll make sense. That'll leave our, our bad debt expense 23,240, okay? And that's the amount we'll take. So here's the difference between the two methods. With the percent of sales method, we do a percentage of sales. That's the amount we debit to bad debt expense and credit to allowance for doubtful accounts. If the allowance for doubtful accounts had a balance already, it's just gonna add to that. And you're gonna have this new balance, okay? So on this one, to make that adjustment so our allowance account doesn't just keep growing and growing, we actually will adjust the percentage over time. We'll start to look at it and say, hey, looks like my allowance for doubtful accounts keeps growing. So instead of doing 2%, I'm gonna start doing 1.5%. You make the adjustment at that level to keep the allowance reasonable. Again, in a perfect, if you did it perfectly, you'd have a zero balance in your allowance for doubtful accounts at the end of each year as you were writing off accounts and, you, and debiting them. And then the analysis of receivables method, we calculate the amount of the expense and then, and then we, make, we subtract out the, the, the balance and that tells us uh, how much we're gonna do for, uh, for our entries. So that's the, the main difference between the two. All right, let me just say that most people find this chapter a welcome respite, uh, a little easier than some of the other chapters. So hopefully it's the same for you. It's a chance to not have a really crazy heavy chapter that you're dealing with. So on to, so those that all had to do with accounts receivable and that all had to do with how we deal with when people can't pay us, right? That's a lot actually for, for just dealing for the fact that people can't pay you sometimes. So this is what's called a note payable. So these are sort of all the different items you'll see on it. The first is what's called the maker of the note. That's the person who is lending the money, okay? And then you'll have the payee, or sometimes it's called the borrower. And then we'll have what's called the face amount. That's the amount they're borrowing. So in this case, it's $2,000. issue in state, the due date, when they're going to have to pay, the term, it's only a 90-day note, and is that it? And then the interest rate, how much interest they're going to pay. So this is all the information that really has to be legally on a note. There will usually be also some terms and disclaimers, like what happens if they don't pay on time, right? And so sometimes it's a couple pages long. But this is the primary information that has to be on there. In essence, 
who's lending the money to whom, how much they're lending, how long they're lending it for, and what interest rate they're gonna pay. That's really what you have to know to, to be able to deal with these. All right. So to figure out the due date, this is actually harder. If you're like me and like you start trying to have when, when anything involves days and months, you have to like count on your fingers to make sure you got all the days in there right. Um, then this is the process. So if, so we have this note and we have to compute what the due date is. You might see a problem that's like, hey, they start a note on this day. It's a 90 day note, what's the due date? You may have to, be, to calculate that. Again, kind of dumb because computers do that for us now, right? Pretty much like even my mother loans money to people and like for years she would be like, can you like create a, she'd call me, you know, can you create a promissory note for me? And I'm like, mom, there's templates, like they're everywhere. Like just, just like Google it, right? And, and she was uncomfortable doing that. And so I would do that for her, but seriously, you can just go, you could go online. If you want to lend money to someone, you could be like promissory note template and it would just do this. And then you would even put in like, you know, start date, term, interest rate, and it would, it would totally just calculate all that for you and even give you like what's called an amortization table, which shows how the payments break down. Okay. So the notes for this chapter are all going to be what we call like single pay notes, which means I lend money to you at a certain interest rate for a certain amount of time. And then when the note comes due, you're going to pay me back all of the money I lent you plus the interest. Later, we'll get into installment notes. They're more complicated. Okay. That, again, that's why we use software to deal with them. So to figure it out, um, what was the issuance date? It didn't say. Oh, March 16th. Okay. So if we were doing a note on March 16th and it was a 90-day note to calculate the um, due date, we would take the number of days in March, to count your knuckles, someone taught you that? January, February, March, the ones on your knuckles have 31 days. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> so 31 days in March minus the issue date gives you the days remaining in March. Add the days in April, add the days in May, add the days in June. And that tells you, and that has to add up to 90. Okay, I mean, it's not crazy hard, but sometimes breaking it down into those pieces makes it a lot more doable instead of being like, I have no idea how to do this. Again, you could probably also Google a calendar that would be like start date of note, number of days, and it would tell you the due date if, if you needed to do that. Sometimes, yeah. And then you're like, is it a leap year? Yeah, and the problem would tell you, but in real life, you'd have to be like, oh man, there's 29 days in February this year, so I have to adjust for that. My son used to date a girl whose birthday was on February 29th. So even though they were, you know, like 20, she was actually only five because she's only had five birthdays. Uh, uh, I was like, do your parents only do birthday for you every February, like 29th? So every four years and they, they do a special birthday for her on February 28th, the other years. So that, I wouldn't, I'd be like, sorry, God cursed you to be born on that day. You have to live with it. Okay. So I'll give you four times as many presents next leap year. Okay. I don't know why, like this poor girl, like he's dating her and like they have this nice relationship. And I was like, so like obsessed with the fact that she was born on February 29th, like but like, I would like, I have to say something about it every time you guys ever do that. You date somebody and like your dad has to say something to them every time. Sorry. It's a dad thing. Like we're just annoying. Okay. Um, they're like, people are like, that's why I don't date people. All right. You have to deal with it. All right. So to calculate interest on a note, we have to remember this basic formula, which is principal times rate times time P times R times T. That's a pretty simple formula as far as formulas go. You could just put PRT without little X's in the middle if you are like an algebra person or something. But it's principal times rate times time. And this is an important thing to remember. The principal is the amount 
borrowed. Okay, that's what the principle of a note is. The rate is the annualized interest rate. So like in the last note, they only borrowed it for 90 days, but we're still gonna do the annualized interest rate. So this note is 10% is per year, not 10% per 90 day period, okay? And so since we're always gonna do our rate is annualized interest, then our days have to also be annualized. So they have to be written as a fraction of a year. For this problem, they've used what's called the 360 day convention, which I've mentioned to you before. Um, sometimes in accounting, they just assume that for, for ease of calculations, that a year is made up of 12 30 day months. It's nice when they do that, it makes your life a little bit easier. Other times, um, uh, people do 365 day a year. Most of the time now they do 365 days because again, computers are doing all the work so it doesn't make it that much harder, right? But just so you have to look and the problem will tell you, assume 360 days, okay? You'll have to look for that. Another point at which accounting forces you to have attention to detail, all right? So if we do principal times rate times time, it's the amount borrowed times the annual rate times, so, 90 out of 360 is, everybody know? 0.25, one fourth, right? It's a quarter of a year. Um, and so what we're saying is you borrowed $2,000 for 10% 10, 10 per year for 0.25 of a year or a quarter of a year. It's really important that we have these in the correct units, so to speak, the correct terms, that the interest rate is annualized and that the, the time is put into a fraction of a year, okay? Or else it's not, it's not gonna come out right. So if you're doing days, you just do 90, the number of days over 360. If, it's, if you're doing months, it's the number of, number of months over 12, okay? Because that's the number of months in a year. So this now is gonna be $50 in interest which means that at maturity, this note is gonna receive $2,050 back. So if I'm the lender, the maker of the note, I give you $2,000 and 90 days from now, you give me $2,050. That's the nature of the arrangement. What's that $50? It's interest. It's the fee that I'm charging you for using my money for that amount of time because I can't use it during that time, right? And there's some risk you won't pay me back. And so that's all factored into that interest rate that I'm charging you. Recognize that things aren't free, right? When you borrow money, you have to pay interest on it. That's just, I mean, that's just a normal part of business. All right. So this one says, assume that a company accepts a 30 day 12% note dated November 21st in settlement of the account of WA Burns company. Uh, which is past due and has a balance of $6,000. The company journalizes the receipt of the note as follows. So here you've got a customer that has an account receive that you have an account receivable for, and they come to you and they're like, hey, I can't pay you. And you're like, well, when can you pay me? And they're like, I can pay you in 30 days. And so you say, well, let's, let's make an arrangement, right? We'll transfer this over from an account payable, account receivable for me, account payable for them, an account receivable, to a note receivable. And so the first journal entry is to debit notes receivable. Remember that's an asset. So your note receivable is going up and credit account receivable. So it's going away. In essence, you're saying I'm paying off this debt you owe me with another debt, but it's a debt that's more structured and has a more official term written up. At the due date, the company journalizes the receipt. So what you would have to figure out is like, how much are they gonna have to pay? So you would go, okay, principal times rate times time. $6,000 times 12% or 0.12 times time. And it was 30 days, right? So 30 over 360. That's gonna come out to 60 bucks. That's gonna be the amount of interest they have to pay. So when they pay me, then they're gonna pay me $6,060 at the end of 30 days. So I'm gonna debit cash for the $6,060, my cash is going up. I'm gonna credit the note receivable, meaning they no longer owe me that money, I'm, that's going down. And I'm gonna credit interest revenue. 
because I've now earned that revenue. So that's the journal entry for collecting a note, you know, in the proper time when they've paid us. Here's Crawford Company. They issue a $40,000 90-day 12% note dated December 1st to settle the account receivable. So again, we have this, so this is not again, this is another issue, is if we lend money to somebody and then the end of the accounting year happens, right? We have to, dem we have to record, do an adjusting entry at the end of the year for any interest we've accrued up to the end of the year, even though we're not gonna collect it until next year. So what they did here is they said, this was December 1st, at December 31st, we just do this journal entry that's interest receivable and interest revenue. Recognize we've earned one month worth of interest during this year. So we have to record it as part of our revenue. And then the remaining two months of interest revenue we'll earn in the next year, okay? So if you remember back to when we did adjusting entries and I'm like, these don't go away, here's where they're, they're like, they're poking their head out again, like whack-a-mole, it's whack and adjusting entry. It, it doesn't roll off great, but anyway. So recognize that if a note extends over an accounting period from one year to the next, we'll have to do an adjusting entry at the end of this year to recognize any revenue, interest revenue we've earned during this year, okay? Then when they actually pay us, we'll show our cash, which is, you know, they borrowed 4,000. The interest receivable from the previous years was, year was $40. And then the interest revenue for this year, the next two months worth of interest is recorded as revenue. And that shows the whole amount of cash we're collecting, okay? So that's how we would record it when we collect the money from them. What do receivables look like on a balance sheet? Normally, um, well, that's assets. That doesn't help us. So don't look at that. But normally, uh, account receivables are going to be called current liabilities. I'm sorry, current assets. Um, oh, it does have it. And then what I was saying it didn't have is notes receivable, which is which are considered depending upon their due date. If they're due within next year. We list a note receivable as part of our current assets. If they're due more than a year from now, we list them as a long-term or a non-current asset, okay? Um, also recognize that some long-term notes can have, if they're being paid in installments, some could be due within the next year and the rest of it could be due more than a year from now. So it's very common to see something that says current portion of long-term notes in the current assets and then than the long-term notes in the long-term section. Um, anyway, so that's just another thing to be more confusing. All right. A couple of new formulas uh, for us to do financial analysis. The first one is something called accounts receivable turnover. So this has to do with how quickly we're collecting money that's owed to us. So for years, I did research on what kills businesses. Uh, I really was focused in the small business arena more than the large business one. Um, and found out there's like eight things that account for like 95% of all business failures in the first two years. And one of the top eight is failure to collect the money that's owed to you. So you're making lots of sales, your revenue looks good, even your, your income statement shows you're making a profit, but you're owed hundreds of thousands of dollars. Believe it or not, this is actually what put my father-in-law out of business. He was, he was a contractor in Southern California and in the 1960s, and he was doing these huge jobs. He was building high rises, and he had three different customers who each owed him something like $2 million a piece, all declared bankruptcy. Boom, boom, boom. And so he had worked his employees to work on these buildings. He owed them pay. He had bought materials from suppliers, all trusting that this $6 million that was owed to him was gonna come in and they all hit him in a row and he was unable to, and if you can't pay your employees, guess what they do? They go find other jobs. And if you can't pay your suppliers, they don't give you more materials on credit till you can pay them. Um, it's a pretty tough lesson for him to learn. It was pretty hard. Um, uh, so, Accounts receivable turnover manage or, or, or is a way of measuring how successful we are at collecting the money that's owed to us. 
So we just take our sales, uh, which is sales revenue, and divide that by our average accounts receivable, which again would be our accounts receivable at the beginning of the year or the period that we're looking at, plus our accounts receivable at the end of that period divided by two, that's the average. Again, the reason we have to do that on these is that sales are, are, are measured, they're a temporary account that measures the amount of sales revenue over a period of time, a month, a quarter, a year but accounts receivable is an asset. So if we ever look at our balance sheet, it just tells us how much the asset is right now. So you can't really compare something which is a measurement over time to something which is a measurement of something I have right now. So by taking the average, that is sort of saying, what was the accounts receivable over that period of time? Okay, that's why we have to do the average. So just take your sales divided by your average accounts receivable. Um, and then, the second one is called number of stays sales in receivables, which is how quickly do I collect this? So you take your average accounts receivable and then you divide it by your average daily sales. And those are the two for this chapter. You know, there's like a couple of these each chapter where you have to do a little formula and that's it. So like I said, this chapter is pretty manageable for most people. Yes. I'm sorry, no, you missed it. Right, you're good. <laughs> You have a book, has this in it. All right, all right. I know it's easier to take a picture of it and then you just refer back to your picture. My problem is, as I take pictures of things and there's no easy way to like reference those unless I dump them into like, like files or something. And so I'm always like thinking I'm gonna look back and I never do. It's kind of like taking notes at like a church meeting where I think I'm gonna read this again and I'm gonna have this spiritual feeling all over again. And then, I find it like 10 years later. I'm like, I don't even know what I was thinking when I wrote that. So uh, <laughs> same idea. All right. That's the problem with notes. All right. We good. Any questions? All right. Have a terrific day. Remember who you are and always be kind. I don't know what else. That's enough for one day. All right. Thanks guys.